of the National Spiritual Assembly. May I welcome you all and apologize again in, for the uh, cramped conditions we find ourselves in, which is a good sign, because so many friends are here tonight, and uh, that's not a surprise. But many friends are here from various parts of, of the country, and indeed from the Republic of Ireland, from Dublin, so welcome. I um, would also like to acknowledge the presence here of Councillor Shirin Fosda Farudi and members of the Auxiliary Board. It is a great privilege to have with us this evening one of the very distinguished believers of the formative age of the faith of Baha'u'llah. Ian Semple served as a member of the Universal House of Justice, uh, the international governing body of the Baha'i faith, a body ordained by the manifestation of God himself as the supreme governing body of his mighty cause. From its inception in April 1963 until Nauru's March 2005. And many of you know uh, about Mrs. Semple's services, but I still think it's worthy to recall some of the highlights. Mr. Semple heard about the faith when he was a student at Pembroke College at Oxford University and embraced the cause in January 1950. He went on to serve on the National Spiritual Assembly of the British Isles, as it then was, first elected in 1956, including a spell as its secretary between January 1960 and January 1961. Between 1957 and 1961, Mr. Semple also served as an auxiliary board member pro propagation of the Baha'i faith in the British Isles and in Norway and Sweden. He eventually left the, United, the British Isles in 1961 when he was elected to serve on the International Baha'i Council and served uh, on that institution as its assistant secretary until his election to the Universal House of Justice in April 1963 and was re-elected on eight successive occasions to the Supreme Body. Professionally, Mr. Semple is a Chartered Accountant, qualifying as a Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales in 1955. Among many of the um, Distinguishing privileges that Mr. Semple has had, of course, uh, includes uh, being a pilgrim in the Holy Land in May 1957 in the presence of the beloved guardian himself. Mr. Semple is joined this weekend by his dear wife, Louise. He's been sharing many recollections of uh, his years of service in the Baha'i community of the British Isles and of the early meetings of the House of Justice in London in April 1963 with the friends who've been uh, participating in the open weekend tours uh, at the National Baha'i Centre today and he'll be there tomorrow doing the same. It is therefore with a, with a great sense of privilege and uh, delight that on your behalf I welcome to the stage Mr Semple who will speak tonight about the guardianship and the Universal House of Justice. Well, thank you, dear friends. Does this work all right? Is it the right sort of height? Okay. If it doesn't, just wave or leap up and down or something, and I'll do what I can. Um, when recalling uh, these past years doing today, uh, it occurred to me once or twice uh, to think how much the British Baha'i community has grown in that short time. Uh, when I left in 1961, I recollect there were about 800 Baha'is in the whole British Isles. And uh, they were already not only uh, operating 25 local spiritual assemblies, but uh, directing the work in uh, East and West Africa and uh, starting to think about the Pacific and uh, all sorts of things, when they were in fact about the size of a 
a uh, normal non-denominational local congregation. Uh, but the faith obviously has much greater strength, as you see by that range of activities that they are undertaking. Now, just to see the size of the friends here and think of all the other friends out in the British Isles, it's a um, tremendous advance. Um, what I must have been asked to talk about uh, tonight is the guardianship and the Universal House of Justice, uh, which in a sense is a brief sort of outline of part of the history of the faith. Uh, I think history is vital for us to know and understand, but also to see ourselves as part of it. We can't divide life just quite rigidly into the past and the present and the future. Um, academically, maybe one has to. Um, I remember uh, when I was at university, one of the fr my friends wanted to study the um, history of the First World War. And he was told by the professor of history that he couldn't do that. That wasn't history, that was current affairs. Um, <laughs> but really, this uh, current affairs is just a continuation of history. Um, this was brought home to me in, uh, I think it was in 1962, when we were commemorating the ascension of Baha'u'llah in Bahji. And in those days, uh, we would go out there in the evening and um, we'd uh, have, have a meal together, and then we'd spend the evening either dozing or walking around and uh, probably sitting talking, and then finally um, and probably go to sleep for a while, finally in the morning hours have the commemoration of the ascension of Baha'u'llah. Well, that particular evening, while we were sitting around the table where we'd been eating, uh, the hand of the cause, Mr. Samandari, who was there with us, said how moved he was to be there on that evening, because it was the first time he'd been in Bahji on the night of the ascension since it took place. And we realized he had been a pilgrim in the presence of Baha'u'llah when Baha'u'llah had ascended, and here he was sitting with us. That's how short Baha'i history is. This is just the uh, 162, am I right? Yes, that's right. And um, we're in the middle of the second century. We're not, in Baha'i terms, in the, middle of the, uh, the beginning of the 21st century. We're in the middle of the second century. We're at the springtime of the world. Now, we remember this when every Razwan we think of the Declaration of Baha'u'llah. Uh, but we should think of it also as we look at the developments that have taken place in these recent decades. Uh, we're recalling today the visit of Abdul Baha to the United Kingdom. And I don't think there are any Baha'is left here now who re recall that visit, but there still were when I first became a Baha'i. There were one or two. Um, that, that it was following the passing of Abu Baha, when Shoghi Effendi was here in, in London, that um, he learned of the death of Abu Baha and had returned to the Holy Land. He was a very young man. A lot of the Baha'is now are youth, and I think quite a lot of youth are here this evening. Just think what it must have meant to a young man of 25 to suddenly find himself in the position of the guardian of the cause of God, appointed that by his beloved grandfather, Abdul Baha. Um, it was a shattering experience for Shoghi Effendi. And it may, it may be, if you think yourself, what, what would you do if suddenly you were told, look, here is the cause of God for a thousand years, uh, look after it. Be the guardian of this cause. Protect it. Teach it. Build it. And that's what Shoghi Effendi faced. And he faced doing this with both tremendous positive assets and tremendous liabilities. Positively, there were uh, many, many deeply devoted Baha'is around the world who rallied to, to him, who turned to him, as Abdul Baha had said, who just longed to do what he wanted to do what he showed them for the advancement of this cause. It wasn't that they were starting from scratch, because Abdu'l-Baha had already been talking to them. You had people like Martha Root, 
who went around the world. And you read the letters uh, between Martha Root and Shoghi Effendi and see this profound love that existed between them. And one must remember how, cl how small the Baha'i world was in those days when the Guardian became, Shoghi Effendi became the Guardian. Um, it was a very small Baha'i world. And so there was an intimate, loving relationship among the true Baha'is in those days. Um, there were also squabbles, as there are between human beings. I remember uh, Hassan Balyuzi telling me about the early community in, in England. He said that they were real strong characters. They had to be to be Baha'is in those days. It wasn't easy for someone like Lady Blomfield to be a Baha'i. And he said, they, they, but they so loved one another. He said they would come together and they'd fight like cat and dog. And then they'd, they'd go apart and do something. And then they couldn't, they just had to come together again. And, um, but they had their strong ideas. They had only just begun to learn about the faith. They hadn't any of the letters of the Guardian. He'd just become Guardian. Um, and they were strong characters, but they fought for the cause. They loved the cause. And they clung together. And this, unity among the friends, and the love among the friends, and the idealism of the friends, their willingness to go out and sacrifice themselves, was what enabled the Guardian to build so much. But we shouldn't think it was easy for him, because he was faced with the most tremendous obstacles in the very early years of his guardianship. Um, some of the most prominent Baha'is turned against him. Avare, who was a, an outstanding teacher of the faith in Iran, uh, thought he could tell the Guardian how to run the cause of God. Ahmad Sohrab, who was the secretary of Abu Baha, didn't like the idea of the administrative order and did all he could to undermine it. Now, if you read some of the things that uh, uh, Ahmad Sohrab wrote, they sound, you may say, very reasonable in some ways. Um, he showed his, his reasonableness in some ways by, or his uh, reasonableness, by um, the way he mistranslated some of Abdu'l Baha's talks. Sometimes when Abdu'l Baha would talk about the uh, fear of God, Ahmad Sarab would think that wasn't quite the thing people wanted to hear. He translated as the love of God. Uh, this thinking one knows better then the center of the cause is um, the beginning of a rather slippery slope. But the Guardian had to face this. And right at the heart of the problems he had with his family was one Baha'i called Nayar Afnan, who had been accepted back into the faith after having broken the covenant. But he was there in the family. He was a descendant of Baha'u'llah. And there was a story I was told, I think it was by Hassan Sabri, about an early pilgrim, shortly after Shoghi Effendi became the guardian, who was on pilgrimage, and he went to Bahji. And in Bahji he was met by Nayar Afnan, who lived in the little house, uh, which is now between the shrine and the pilgrim house there. And um, Nayar said, uh, that, of course, Shoghi Effendi had been pointed, appointed in the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha, and they naturally had to obey, obey, obey Abdu'l Baha's will and testament. But Shoghi Effendi was really a very difficult person to work for. He was very impatient, and uh, it was hard working for him. But, of course, they had to obey the will. This horrified Mr. Sabri that someone would say this about the Guardian. But he had his visit to Bahtri, and when he returned to um, Haifa, uh, Shoghi Effendi asked if he'd visited Bahati. He said, yes. He said, did you see anybody there? And he said, yes, Nayar Afnahan. And he said, did she say anything to you? And uh, uh, Mr. Sabri just couldn't say anything. He said, nothing particular. And then afterwards, later that night, he thought to him, so what have I done? The guardian asked me, did Nayar say anything? And I didn't tell him. So the next morning he was up at the crack of dawn to see the Guardian. And so he recounted what Naya had said. And the Guardian said to him, we must be grateful that he accepts the Wooden Testament. What he said about me doesn't matter. Then later, 
the guardian's sister, against his will, married Nair Afnan. And Nair Afnan gradually poisoned the whole family against the guardian. And Rahir Khanum recalled how when she was, uh, shortly after she was married, the guardian would sit with the members of his family and saying, this Nair, this Nair, this Nair, he will destroy you all, send him away. And they wouldn't. And that is what happened, that Nair Afnan poisoned the minds of the members of Shoghi Fendi's family against him and caused them all to break the covenant. Now, I mention this now because it's the background at which you could see what Shoghi Effendi achieved. When you read these marvelous letters that he wrote to the West, the Baha'i administration, the uh, world order letters, his letters encouraging the friends, all this outpouring of enthusiasm, of guidance, of love, was made against a background of criticism and uh, barbs and uh, problems caused to him by those who were closest to him. Now, I mentioned it now at the beginning because you should understand this. But this is not the, the fulfillment of everything. He had many problems. For example, the, shortly after he became guardian, the followers of Mirza Muhammad Ali stole the keys of the shrine. The shrine of Baha'u'llah. And here was this young man who left trying to get the keys back. He eventually got them back. Uh, but these were the sort of things he was dealing with. Um, but when you look at what he was doing with the whole Baha'i world, he wrote these fantastic letters, these marvelous letters to read. And it's good to read them through. Don't just dip into them. Get the Advent, get the Baha'i administration and the Advent of Divine Justice and the World Order letters and read them through. It may take quite a while, but you see the unfolding of his ideas. Uh, one night I was told by Leroy Iowas, his hand of the cause, that the Guardian, I said to him, Leroy, do you think that when I became guardian, I had this whole pattern of the administrative order laid out before me, and I began, as, as I thought best, to gradually unfold it to the Baha'is. And Leroy said, well, yes, sure, give any. In fact, that's what I did think. He says, it's not true. He says, I didn't know. I just had to take one decision after another. Abdu'l Baha had said I would be guided, and I trusted Abdu'l Baha. So it wasn't the Shogaf any anyway, he had funny feelings inside that he was getting a guidance. Abdul Baha said he would be guided, so he had confidence in Abdul Baha that he would be guided. And when something needed deciding, he would decide it. And he would know it was right, and he would move on, and then the next stage would evolve. And he didn't hesitate to change his mind occasionally. Uh, this is where one has to understand that the manifestation of God and those that he leaves at the center of his faith are sensible people. And the Guardian appointed a language to be translated in the goals of the plan, and the National Assembly wrote back and said, Mushogi Fendi, we've looked to find this language, but it, we're told it became dis extinct you know, two generations ago. So he said, all right, translate such and such a language. Uh, he didn't say, oh dear, oh dear, I've become, you know, I've made a mistake, I can't be infallible. You know, he says, oh, I said choose that, all right, doesn't work, choose another one. <laughs> um, but he had the, the, a combination of great wisdom and great confidence and great humility and great good common sense. And you see this comes out in all his writings. So I do ask you to, to make a point of reading through his writings. Um, you may say it's difficult English. Well, in some ways it is. Um, but that's because it's extremely good English. He says things clearly. Um, he'll um, take, you take a, a, a sentence of the Guardians, it seems a very long sentence, but in fact it's a, con, it's a, a, a constricted uh, paragraph. He's got so many ideas in, and he used to read a, write aloud. He said, Rehe Khanum said he, would li he, he liked to read aloud when he was writing. And sometimes this helps if you have any difficulty with the Guardian's writings. Read it aloud, because that's how he wrote it. And this is how it makes sense, how it links together. Uh, you may be able to do, make sense without you know, reading it aloud, but it helps sometimes, because you see the, the periods of the, the flow of his ideas. Now, doing this, the Guardian gradually built up the Baha'i world. He started with 
constructing the administrative order. Now, early on, he had wanted to call the election of the Universal House of Justice. And in fact, he gathered to Haifa a number of prominent Baha'is from around the world to consult about what could be done. And he came to the conclusion that it couldn't be done. It wasn't the time. It was premature. At first, he had to build the groundwork on which the house could rest. So you see this whole, all his letters about um, the election of local assemblies, how local assemblies function, um, the spirit that has to suffuse consultation, and then the election of national assemblies, and how national assemblies function. This, this, all this business of administrative functioning uh, was essential to the cause. Some Baha'is criticized him, said, well, why are you doing all this? What about the, um, the, the divine plan, the Abdul Baha? In fact, this is what Ahmad Sorab said. He said, why are you talking about all this administration when Abdul Baha's divine plan is there? Why don't you put it into effect? And the Guardian explained that he had to have instruments. Martha Root was the greatest teacher we've known, but very little remained of what she did because there was nothing to follow up. There was no structure. There were no local communities. No local spiritual assemblies, let alone national assemblies and, and, um, uh, and uh, committees and so on. So this is how the Guardian ap approached things, with the guidance of God. As I say, he told Leroy he didn't plan it from the beginning, but he just saw what he had to do at first, and he did it. And so, in these number of years, he raised up the structure of the administration, and then began to implement the divine, pl divine plan of Abdu'l Baha. He started this series of great teaching plans. First of all, the first seven-year plan, when in America they had to get established assemblies in every state and every province of Canada and open Latin America. Then the, the second seven-year plan, and the European teaching campaign. And in Britain, while in the second seven-year plan was going on, of course, he got various other countries joining in. And in Britain we had our six-year plan. And that's when I had the good fortune to become a Baha'i, towards the end of the six-year plan in 1950. And uh, then the community was just humming. Uh, the pioneers had gone out all over the United Kingdom, established these assemblies, and they were very delicate things. I mean, you had to keep on re-pioneering to save the assemblies. <laughs> and uh, it, the National Assembly would send out almost weekly bulletins as the end of the plan approached, that, you know, two more gaps in this place, three gaps here. And the friends would get up and pioneer, and eventually the, the six-year plan was won. Just. With a tremendous effort. But it was a basis. All the time the Guardian would raise us up to establish a, a, a foundation on which we could move forward. And the British Baha'is had no longer, no sooner, as it were, taken a deep breath with accepting the idea of the completion of the six-year plan, the Guardian opened the idea of the Africa campaign to their minds. That, I mean, it's one thing to pioneer from, you know, London to uh, Belfast or Dublin or something like this, but to pioneer to Africa? Uh, and many of the pioneers, if you talk to pioneers of the Ten-Year Crusade, you'll hear a number of them hadn't the faintest idea where they were going. Iran Mahaja tells me that when she and Dr. Mahaja were to pioneer to Indonesia, she hadn't the funniest idea where Indonesia was, let alone what it was like. And they went there. And these pioneers just arose and went out and scattered the faith all over the world. The Guardian used to talk often of the need to, for the diffusion of the faith first, and then the suffusion of the faith. So it spread it all over the world, and then in all these countries to deepen the, the depth of the spirit of the faith in those countries. And this is what has been going on. <coughs> Having got these plans going, he was using his, his administration to, to send the faith out into the world. He continued the building of the administrative order. And one great astonishment to the Baha'i world was in 1951, when he uh, appointed the first International Baha'i Council. Because in those days, remember, we just learned about local assemblies and national assemblies. And suddenly here was an international institution that he said was the embryo of the Universal House of Justice. Now, one thought of the House of Justice as being something way, way in the future. Um, and, but then now this was, as it were, the foretaste, um, a sort of aperitif <laughs> to the Baha'is. Um, 
And we saw something begin to, to function. Now, in, in the Holy Land, of course, this was also the Guardian getting some reliable helpers. For a long time, his helpers were his brothers and cousins, and um, they were the ones that turned against him. Until, of course, he had to hear Khanum. And she became his secretary. And there's this uh, wonderful cable he wrote about her, that he was, she was his um, shield against the covenant breakers and his help meet in all his, his labors. And you can see that. And this is really a, another whole story, but I hope if Violette Nachtavani comes again to, to London, she can tell you more about Rehe Khanum, because she was the most extraordinary woman, um, of tremendous character, great love, great understanding, and profound humility. And she was there at the Guardian's right hand, helping him and writing his letters. And again, you see the smallness of the high world. You read the letters from Rehir Khanan to the Secretary of the National Assembly of the British Isles. They address Dear John. John Ferriby is the Secretary. So Rehir Khanan calls him Dear John. Now he would actually call her Rehir Khanan. But even so, there was this closeness and this love between the friends. And um, so now we had some friends who were sent to Haifa. I remember in, in um, England, we were all astonished when suddenly we got this message to the National Assembly, asked Lotfullah Hakim to go to Haifa for services. Lotfullah Hakim was uh, the descendant of, I think, the earliest Jewish Baha'i in the faith. And he'd been pioneering, he'd served Abu Baha, he was pioneering at this time in Edinburgh, I think. And um, so he went to Haifa, we didn't know why. And then there were two elderly ladies in, in America, the Rebel sisters who were devoted Baha'is, they were called there too, the Jesse and Ethel. And they were two wonderful souls, um, small ladies, uh, lovely sisters, but very different in character. Um, Rehir Khanum said once that there were two uh, saints in Haifa. One was Ethel Ravel, the other was Alice Kidder. Alice Kidder was a, someone who was keeping as a companion for, the, uh, for Rehir Khanum at that time. But Ethel Ravel was that. She was a saint, absolutely a saint in every way. And um, had a very wry sense of humor. Uh, she always worked every day. If she got some job, she just worked until it's finished. And then she went to sleep, even if it was two o'clock in the morning. The next day was a new day and she started again. Uh, when I was in pilgrimage, the last morning, I got up rather early to get ready to leave. And Ethel Ravel was up down the kitchen, already beginning to get breakfast, and she, she had a, one of her eyes didn't work properly with the other. It looked out a little bit. And so she tended to hold her head on one side. And, um, as I came into the kitchen, she looked at me and said, the early bird catches a worm. Who wants a worm anyway? <laughs> <laughs> that was typical of Ethel. Now, Jessie was, was a, a quite a different character. She was a bulldog. She had the uh, international fund in her hands. In fact, she had it in a, in a pink uh, toffee tin. And uh, she kept it in her room, and her room was the only room in that building that had a Yale lock on it, because she had the fund in there. And uh, she would bargain for the faith. She, would, she was absolutely rigid in the, in the defense of the faith. So these two sisters were there. And uh, then gradually other members, other members of the council. Uh, and we just got uh, the idea of the council being called into being by the Guardian, when the following December, December 51, he appointed the first living hands of the cause of God. Up till then, the only hands we'd ever thought of or heard of were ones from the time of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha, or ones who'd been appointed posthumously. And clearly they were the most outstanding people, but the idea of actually having a hand of the cause of God in this world whom you could meet and talk to just never occurred to us. This was again something for the future. Suddenly, here were the hands of the cause appointed by the Guardian. This was such a thrill to the Baha'i world. And I remember one of the few I had met at that time was, was um, Hermann Grossmann. And he seemed so obviously to be a hand. I mean, once he was appointed, oh, of course, you know, that's what a hand is like. And there's these hands were appointed around the world. And um, the guy, this was only still in 1951. And the Guardian had obviously started the building of the administrative order at the base got the National Assemblies going, then suddenly started from the top on the appointed arm. And here's the Guardian was appointing his hands. And they had only been functioning, he appointed various other groups of hands afterwards, they'd only been functioning a short time 
And he called upon them to appoint auxiliary board members. Now, no one had ever heard of auxiliary board members before then, but these helpers to the hands that they had to appoint. And um, some of the hands were asking him, whom should they appoint? He said, that's your job. I'm appointing you, you appoint your auxiliary board members. So this whole concept, which is quite new and very difficult for some Baha'is, because we'd got out of the way of thinking of certain Baha'is as being, you know, kingpins. We got used to the in of institutions as being the authoritative bodies. And um, then suddenly to have individuals who had, r had rank and, and uh, status and, and advisory authority over assemblies rather jangled the brains of some friends. They found it highly difficult to accept. Because we hadn't got used to this idea. This administrative order has this side of appointed persons, the hands of the cause and their auxiliary board members, doing certain functions which are different from the sort of functions we're used to in other religions. They're not a clergy. Very different. And yet they, they, they are, the guardian in, in the dispensation describes these different uh, elements of the Baha'i administration. And that again is a thing to read through very carefully. For example, he has the principle of democracy, which is evident there in the, in the methods of election. There's the principle of monarchy, which is as the guardian and his appointees. Um, and then there's the, the function, uh, uh, quality of, um, uh, aristocracy. Now, some friends thought, oh, the aristocrats, the hands, but that's not it. The arist, the principle of aristocracy appears in the responsibility of spiritual assemblies and their members to decide what they believe is right, not what they think the people will want. Assemblies are responsible to consult the Baha'is, to find out what the Baha'is think, to find out what they need. But their authority is to God, to decide what by conscience they believe is right. Now this is what aristocracy means, it's what is the principle of our election of bodies. An aristocrat is, is the rule of the best. Aristos means the best. So the principle of Baha'i election is for the believers to elect the best. Now they're not going to be marvelous. We're all human beings, but that's the aristocratic principle, that we shouldn't appoint people that we think have to do what we believe. The sovereign is not the people. The sovereign is God. This is the kingdom of God on earth, not the republic of God on earth. <laughs> and when we elect our, our spiritual assemblies, we are electing those whom we feel are best, whom we will obey, whom we can consult, whom we can advise, but whom we will obey. This is the aristocratic principle in the faith. And it's interesting how the hands did this when they came to deal with the House of Justice, but I'll come on to that later. Now the Guardian had been building all this, and so we had this vision of the plan, the Ten-Year Crusade going ahead, uh, when he suddenly passed away. And this was a most tremendous blow to the Baha'i world. He was young. What, 61 I think was he when he died? Um, and we loved the Guardian so intensely. And as I say, it was a small world. And th there were many Baha'is who'd met the Guardian, as I had the bounty of doing. And he was such a considerate person, so full of enthusiasm, and he, he had majesty. I mean, you, you would never sort of, you know, uh, underestimate the state, the statue of the Guardian, but he was so loving. I was a British pilgrim, and um, uh, he welcomed me, and then the first thing he started talking about was the weather. He knew the British people talked about the weather. <laughs> um, but he, 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 in the way that he worked on the pilgrims, he actually, I learned later from Rehir Khan, had solved the problem, and it's, I'm going to mention this, because it's an, an example of how the Guardian, with his humility, solved problems. The problem was this, that the pilgrims used to be gathered, and the Guardian would come in to meet them. Now, as you know, in Western society, ladies do not stand up when men come into the room. So, um, the, some of the Western ladies, when the guardian came in, would continue sitting down and sort of hold up their hand to be sh shake and said, how do you do, Shoki Effendi? And he couldn't permit this. To start with, it was too terrible a test for the Oriental Baha'is. And for anybody else who saw it, it was not, not, he couldn't allow that to happen. But he didn't issue an instruction that when the Guardian comes in, will everybody please stand up, including the ladies? He so arranged it that in future, he was in the room first. And then the pilgrims came in. So of course they were standing up. I mean, you don't come in sitting down. You know. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And then he could welcome them and show them to their seats and be a perfect host and settle you down. This is the sort of way he solved problems. Um, and now, but he couldn't, he could, of course, be, be angry sometimes. Um, because he was a, he was a human being. He himself said he wasn't a, a the, um, exemplar of a high life. Abdul Baha was that. Um, I think Abdul Baha also could be angry from time to time. Um, but, uh, and I'm sure, sure Baha'u'llah also. But, um, the, the degree of, of love, um, you may say, re reached its peak in the manifestation of God. Uh, Rahir Khan told me that when she became a Baha'i, she, she, her only near experience with Rudad Abdul Baha, and she asked one of the members of the Holy Family, was Baha'u'llah really as loving as Abdul Baha was? And this member of the family said, oh, compared with Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha wasn't loving at all. So we get a little glimpse of the degree of the qualities of the manifestation of God. At any rate, uh, when the Guardian was angry, Hirkham says you could feel the whole house shake. He was angry. But he usually wasn't angry with pilgrims. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he, w he was so loving, so understanding, so interested in the pilgrims. He could see the genuineness of the character. One of the things I was frightened about when I went on pilgrimage was I had a, a sneaking feeling that the Guardian could see right through me. He would know what I was like. And that is a very uncomfortable feeling in relation to anybody. I and mean, if it's the cardio of the cause of God, it's extremely uncomfortable. The resolution of that was to learn that that's exactly what he, he did. He, he knew you. But the, the consolation was that the flaws he just ignored. That's not what he was interested in. All right, you had flaws, he knew those. What he wanted was any possibilities that he could do something with. Any possibilities for capacity, which he would encourage. And that's so with, with, with many pilgrims had this similar experience. Um, so he had this positive effect on the friends and aroused their great love and affection. So the friends loved the guardian very, very dearly. And when he passed away, it wasn't just a, the loss of the guardian, it was the loss of Shori Effendi. So we had this, this, uh, funeral in, in London. And Rahir Khanum was here, and she comforted the friends, and she rallied the hands and took them back to Haifa. And then we had this wonderful message that the hands sent out. And they took forward the whole Ten-Year Crusade to a victorious conclusion. It had been, the Guardian had been very worried uh, by the midpoint of the Crusade, that the, things were dying down, they'd had the outflow of pioneers. And he spoke to two lots of pilgrims in different ways. He said, he said this to several groups of pilgrims. But um, to one, one group of pilgrims, he said, I called upon them to pioneer and they wouldn't go. I called upon them to disperse and they wouldn't go. Um, it was the next thing he said. Um, oh, yes, uh, sorry. Yes, it, 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 so personally, wouldn't go. He said, they will leave as refugees. So those are three things. Then the other people, he said, I called upon them to pioneer and they wouldn't go. I called upon them to disperse and they wouldn't go. I will not call upon them again. And of course, then when the Guardian passed away and the hands uh, reminded the Baha'is of the goals of the Ten-Year Crusade, the whole Baha'i world rose up and the Crusade was won. Then with the winning of the crusade, you had the wonderful Congress here. And then the, uh, and the House of Justice had been elected. And this is where the House of Justice comes into the picture. Sorry, I think I'm going a bit too long, I'll have to be careful. Um, but the, the, the House of Justice was faced with this situation once it was elected. What happens to the guardianship? Um, there had been some disagreement among the friends. Some said, obviously, the Will and Testament says how guardians should be appointed. You can't do it because there can't be any guardian. The other was saying, obviously there must be a guardian, it's part of the whole administrative order, there must be a guardian, you see. The hands very wisely said, stop speculating. That's not your business. Only the House of Justice can give an answer. And I remember when the French NSA wrote the covenant, when Mason Remy wrote the covenant, the French NSA followed him. Mr. Faisy came back to Europe afterwards, after the new NSA had been elected. And he told all the friends, he said, the House of Justice is shortly coming into existence. Beware, don't form any preconceived conceptions of what the House of Justice will decide, or you will test yourself. 
be ready for whatever it decides. Now this, of course, from the point of view of the House of Justice, was a tremendous problem. Uh, the Will and Testament, you see, doesn't say how a guardian is to be appointed. The Will and Testament says, first of all, about Shoghi Effendi, that Shoghi Effendi will be uh, succeeded by the firstborn of his lineal descendants. Now, one problem is, what do they mean by lineal? Is it only his children and their descendants, or does it include the other branches, the collateral branches? We don't know. We never had to answer the questions, but that's in the air. Then there was later on that the guardian must appoint his successor in his lifetime. And this choice is to be approved by the nine hands in the Holy Land. Um, okay. And if the guardian's eldest son doesn't fulfill the spiritual qualities of appointment, he should choose another branch and appoint another branch. It says nothing about what the guardian should do if it turns out that all his sons are hopeless, or if there's no one he could appoint, which is what happened. The guardian had no sons. Shoghi Fendi had no sons. And all his brothers and sisters and cousins had broken the covenant. There was no branch for him to appoint. And people asked why the Guardian didn't say anything about this. And the House of Justice, in one of its letters, says we should understand this as an example of the infallibility of the Guardian. If you look at the, uh, the way he explains the, the will of the Testament, it's quite clear that the Guardian's function is interpretation of the sacred texts. He interprets the faith, he defends the faith, he does not legislate on what the text leaves open. And he was distressed he didn't do this. Even with the um, Declaration of Trust and Bylaws of National Spiritual Assemblies, he got the American National Assembly to formulate and enact the Declaration of Trust and Bylaws with his soul-shaking hints interwoven. But he didn't legislate them. He got a National House of Justice to make this law, the Naumusa Akbar. It wasn't for him to say what the friends do when the will of testament leaves something un uncovered. He says the will the, enough is the will and testament in the house of justice. He'd said that to friends when they were worried. He says, you've got enough. And that's what he did. He couldn't say anything. It wasn't interpretive. He didn't say it. But then the house of justice was faced with the problem. What do we have to do? Are we given this function of legislation just so that in such a s situation we can appoint a successor, or we can make a law that how, how a successor can be appointed for Shoghi Effendi? Is that why we have this authority? Or is that something way beyond our capacity? That we shouldn't do that? That it would be a, a breach of our authority to do that? And this consultation had to go on, and we consulted the hands, and we know exactly what the House of Justice decided eventually. They could not appoint a successor to Shoghi Effendi, and it couldn't legislate to make it possible to appoint a successor for Shoghi Effendi. That is what it decided, and it's all it decided. Don't go extrapolating this with their own understandings. We are not interpreters of the cause, any of us. The House of Justice is not the interpreter of the cause. It's not a prophet. It stated what it decided, and we know what it is. Later, when friends asked questions, it explained how this didn't undermine the covenant, how the House of Justice's authority was clearly in the texts, and how it has enough. It can't interpret that the authoritative interpretation is not there in the absence of the Guardian. And because the hands had to be appointed by the Guardian, you see, there it's different. It doesn't say how the Guardian is to be appointed by his predecessor, it's how the Guardian is to appoint his successor. But in the case of the hands, it doesn't say how um, hands are to be appointed, it's, or it, does say how, it does say how hands are to be appointed by the Guardian. It's the opposite way around. So with no guardian, you can't appoint any hands. So the House of Justice then had to discuss this whole relationship between the House of Justice and the hands. Had it authority to tell them what to do in the absence of the guardian? Yes, it was the head of the faith. Um, so it then developed its relationship with the hands. Then it was able to bring into being the boards of councillors, who are not hands. They perform some of the functions of the hands and they are able to carry forward this whole side of teaching and protection in the faith that the hands had done. And um, so in this, in all this work of, of, and of filling in these uh, gaps in the system, of reconstructing the system, the House of Justice was continually referring back 
to the texts of the Guardian and consulting the hands. It used to meet regularly every week with the hands of the cause in the Holy Land. And every time the hands had a, con had a conclave every year, it would meet with the hands of the conclave and decide, discuss the next major decision to be made. So it was a very cl close interrelationship between the hands and the House of Justice. And that again has been a very sad experience over these past years, uh, has been the, the passing of the hands. Two, two very serious events, a series of events, have, as it were, um, round the hearts of the members of the House of Justice. One is the persecutions in Iran, where we had to follow the, the advice of the friends in Iran and take their advice and follow the guidance of, of God as to what should be done in this situation, hoping, at each, every hope and praying, that no action would precipitate worse situations. They would gradually take things forward. So far, the, the guidance seems to have been working, but the friends are still suffering very much in Iran. And this has been a burden on the house for many years. The other was the, the gradual loss of the hands of the cause. Um, this whole institution which had been there, slowly individual hands passed away, some suddenly, some through old age, one through being murdered, you know, Kalinga. Um, and from the House of Justice members' point of view, of course, these were not just, you might say, high officers of the faith that we were losing. They were intimate friends that we wouldn't see anymore. And then, of course, the last was uh, the last of, of that of the passings was Amitabha Haruya Khanum, who had been a tower of strength to the House of Justice all those years. She had served the the Guardian with such incredible. Um, fidelity. And she just transferred that to the House of Justice. And just as she asked the Guardian questions, and she used to often tell about but she's raising issues with the Guardian, but I remember once at the table, um, one of the pilgrims said, uh, Shogi Effendi, when you said so and so, did you mean such and such? And Ruhi Khanum obviously thought the pilgrim was not saying you know, quite sensible, and she intervened and said, oh no. And the Guardian turned to her and said, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is in front of the pilgrims. The guardian would discuss all sorts of things in front of the pilgrims, and there was this lovely relationship. He would, he would, as it were, pull the leg of Ruhi Khanum occasionally. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into details, but for example, she, she used to take little vitamin pills. And he would comment about Americans being very fond of pills. <laughs> but um, but this, this tremendous, um, the the f freedom of expression. And the absolute devotion which the Shriya Khanum gave to the Guardian, she transferred to the House of Justice. Again and again, if she thought something was going wrong at the World Center, or something developing, that she'd come and meet with the House of Justice and say what she thought and what she recommended be done. And then whatever the House of Justice decided, that was it. We went on with that. So that this, the, the loss of Amit al-Baha was a tremendous blow to the House of Justice. But thank God we still have Dr. Varha, one of the hands, who is in fact the occupant of the oldest institution in the whole Baha'i world order, the trustee of Hubble. And uh, this is a vital institution, a very great institution, and um, Dr. Barra is still with. But the, these years have seen this interrelationship between the, the Guardian and the House of Justice, and in the teaching work, of course, the House of Justice has carried forward what the Guardian did. And over these years, as it mentioned in a recent letter, the whole Baha'i world has been experimenting. And at last, we've been able to make a sort of condensation of the lessons of what to do right. And this is really what this present push of the faith is, this whole question of training institutes, of the, the base, you know, the core curriculum, core, not curriculum, core, think of it, what are they called? Activities, yes, sorry, I'm losing my memory. <laughs> um, is, is a, a systematic approach to the teaching work, which the House of Justice has deduced from the successes of the friends in their experimentation with the work. That is why now I think things are beginning to go forward so fast that this is the House of Justice interaction. You must say it's, it's spiritual conversation with the Baha'i world of how things are done. And as the Baha'i world responds, then we can see the faith going faster and faster forward. And this is the same pattern as the Guardian followed. And um, what the future will hold, we don't know. But we can be quite certain the covenant is strong, the covenant is there. And as the guy, we had a Guardian for 36 years without a House of Justice with him, well, now we have the House of Justice maybe for another 800,000 years without the Guardian. I don't know how long. It's not our business. That's God's business. 
But at the present, we have the House of Justice, and that is quite enough to enable the Baha'is to build the world order of Baha'u'llah. Thank you. Half an hour only, so we would like to make use of the time. And we have collected a number of questions. And the first question is, a, is an old favorite and is as follows. Why is membership of the Universal House of Justice exclusively confined to men? Well, the short, short answer to that is, I have the faintest idea. Um, but I think um, we should think about it not within the particular square in which the question is posed, um, but rather think of a... Um, you can't hear. Oh. What? Or then, yes, can you organize this so I can... Okay, yes, is, is that it make sense? No? Where's the bit? I talk in front of it. Does that work better? Okay. Ah, oh, okay, right, well, that makes sense. Right, oh, no. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't want to be talked into the front of. Um, <laughs> Right. Um, yes, as I say, I, 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 the basic thing is I don't have the faintest idea why uh, only men can be elected to the Universal House of Justice, but I think we should think a bit about why it's a problem. Uh, what, how do we conceive of uh, elections and of uh, the nature of election and the nature of, um, of being elected? You see, in the world as a whole, we should remember that democracies have usually evolved as a result of a struggle against a tyranny. Either wresting power from the monarch, um, which has sort of happened in the British constitutional process, or in um, uh, America, of uh, constructing a constitution which carefully pits each of three um, powers against one another to counterbalance one another because you can't trust any one of them. Uh, this is the basic thing. So um, uh, democracy is, is regarded as a way of achieving power in order to limit power. It's all about power. And this is why you have this odd concept of winning an election. That an election is something that the person who wants to be elected wins, and someone else loses. Uh, because it's, it, it, the elector wants to get something. Now, he may want to have power for b beneficial ideas. He may want to know this for the good of the people. He may also want power for very bad ideas. Hitler was elected democratically in Germany and then got the power and misused it. But it's all about power and the limiting of power. Now, my point is that I think in the Baha'i administration, that's a totally, miscon a totally misconception. Baha'i elections have nothing to do with power. The Baha'i elections and the whole Baha'i administration is to do with service. And the... Um, Nobody ever seeks to be elected or appointed. Although I remember one day we did have a letter once to the House of Justice from an individual by saying he thought he'd make a very good councillor. But um, that's <laughs> not, not the, the normal uh, approach because it isn't the Baha'i concept. You don't say, I would like to be a chairman of a local assembly. How do I get, a, get myself elected? It just doesn't, shouldn't occur to Baha'is. Um, the whole Baha'i uh, process gives absolute freedom to the electors, and no freedom at all to those who are elected, or very little freedom. Um, there, there are no nominations, there's no electioneering. The electors are, are left free to use their own sense as to who they think are the nine people best suited to be on this particular body. And they vote. Now the nine people who are elected 
are not given a choice as to whether or not they want to serve. The Guardian said he deprecated refusal to serve. If you're elected boy, you serve, unless there's some very strong reason why you can't, in which case you ask the Assembly, please, would they excuse you and allow you to resign? Which is what happens to members of the House of Justice when they get decrepit like me. You have to ask the House of Justice, may I please resign because I can't do my work properly? The House of Justice says, yes, okay, and then you can resign. And that's what's happened in each case where, where members of the House of Justice have resigned, not because they're a certain age or anything, just because they've come to the conclusion that they couldn't carry on their work as the House required it to be carried on. So that's the situation where was the, the voter conveys authority to, to the people it elects. But the power, as the Guardian says in the Baha'i Faith, is in the hands of the individual believers. The assembly can do nothing unless the individual believers do what they're, uh, they're guided to do. Uh, so the, the thinking is that the people who are voting are conveying authority upon a group of people to carry out what they believe in their own judgment is the right thing. Um, therefore, it's quite wrong for anybody who's, who is elected to think, ah, good, now I've got some power, I can get this done. That's not his job. The job, or her job, is to serve on the assembly as a member of a consultative body to find out what is the correct thing to do in that particular situation, taking into account the, um, you know, the wishes of the Baha'is and the conditions of the Baha'is. So what, therefore, does this mean? Um, the women, as far as the Universal House of Justice is concerned, it's only that body. It's not all the other bodies in the Baha'i faith, appointed or elected, are open to men and women. The only thing happens is that women are not permitted to be elected to the Universal House of Justice. But then this isn't a, a, an exemption or a, a refusal to give them power, but it's an exemption for having to perform a service. Uh, everybody else in the world, if they're elected, all the men, have to, have to perform it. You can't have a man who's elected to the House of Justice saying, sorry, I'm too busy. I'm, I'm in the middle of my career. I'm, I, I'm a great artist, please. I, I, can't, I can't. David Rue was like that. He was a, a, a fine doctor. And he was an expert in medical education. And he loved that. And he was about to resign from the American NSA, or asked if he could, to get back to his profession when he was elected to the House of Justice. And no one asked any more questions. He was elected. And he had to serve. And he managed to struggle on and do some medical work afterwards. So this is the way you should think about it. Now, if it's a, an exemption from performing a service, maybe you should say, all right, this is not very polite to the women. But is it, that's, a, that's an interpretation. Um, but it is an exemption in that sense. Um, it's not something they're entitled to have, some power they're entitled to get, which you're depriving them of. Um, now, this is just my own thinking about it, but I think what's, that's what you have to do. You have to think outside the square, in other words, of what is the nature of service, what is the nature of administration, and what is the concept of power and authority in the Baha'i community. Then, ultimately, I think we'll say, as the Zawadwal says, a time will come, it'll be as clear as the noonday. But at the moment, I think it isn't. I don't even understand it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The next question. Please tell us something more about the personality of Shoghi Effendi. For example, about his voice, how he chanted, how he smiled, and his sense of humor. Mm. Um, I never heard Shoghi Effendi chant because the Westerners didn't. He chanted uh, in the presence of the um, Eastern men um, uh, in the shrine. He used to take them to the shrine and chant to them there. Um, but I'm sure he must have had a very, very melodious chanting voice. The, the Persian friends who heard him said he did. And his speaking voice was very melodious. It was a strong voice. It wasn't a loud voice, but it was strong and very clear. And um, he spoke beautiful English. Um, he was very, um, quite sort of uh, clear in his, his thinking. Um, he, one night he got us to look at the map of the world that he was designing. And he was sort of, his hands were sort of quite sort of pointed, and he was pointing out various things, which was, uh, vigorous hands, you might say. Not strong hands, yes, but vigorous. And he had very beautiful hands, uh, fine and uh, you know, nicely formed. And um, Rehir Khanum said that the, the greatest holy leaf used to get Shoghi Effendi's hands and say, these are my father's hands. And because they, they had hands very like those of Baha'u'llah. Um, and his humor, he had a very, very acute sense of humor. Um, but and one night, I remember, he, um, we were looking at designs for temples, and he got um, Rehir Khanum to get out the tem designs that had been rejected for the temple in Tehran. 
and they were most peculiar. And um, one of them, he got Anna Grossman to hold up so he could see it. And he said, look, Anna, looks like a frog. Anna, what's the German for a frog? And uh, Anna couldn't get it out. She was laughing, and so she couldn't get out the German word frosh. Um, and uh, then the Guardian began to laugh. And I think he, 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 he was of that generation which wasn't polite to, to laugh out loud. You know, he didn't guffaw. He sort of, <laughs> he sort of bubbled with laughter. <laughs> and, and, um, but he, he, uh, he, everyone who knew him said he had a very, very acute sense of humor and a very lovely sense of humor. Um, as I say, he was very kindly. And he was very understanding to people. Ruhir Khan, of Ruhir Khan's favorite stories is about the Guardian and Charles, uh, Charles um, ah, Dunning. Now, Charlie Dunning was a wonderful Baha'i, uh, a strange little man, a little man, a sailor, and he looked like Popeye. <laughs> and uh, he used to, um, at the table, the Guardian would sit here, and da uh, Charlie would sit there at the end of the table, because he was a knight of Baha'u'llah. And um, he would, um, they, they would lean towards one another and talk, you see. And he, he would sort of wave, wave his finger at the Guardian's nose and say, Shogi Effendi, they tell me so and so and so and so, you see. And the Guardian would, like an old crony, lean towards him. And they would talk in this way. And he just loved Charlie Dunning. He saw the, the, the beauty and the, the spirit in Charlie, although most people would think he's a funny little man. And the thing that struck me was after the, uh, Charlie had been on pilgrimage, and, and this made me think an awful lot about the way that one's appearance mirrors one's soul, you might say, because Charlie spoke at the convention about his pilgrimage. And the thing that shook me is, is uh, superficially, Charlie was an ugly little man. But when he was talking, he was beautiful. Mm. Really beautiful. And he didn't change, his features were the same. But this was a beautiful person talking. And I think he was just, his, his soul was, as it were, reflecting what the Guardian, as it were, had seen in him. So th this is just some of the characteristics of the Guardian. I'm afraid it doesn't very much, because I, I'm not very good at explaining. It just, Shogi Effendi, in a sense, is inexplicable. You, you know, I just wish you could have all, all met him. Yeah. Thank you. How would you explain the concept of the infallibility of the Universal House of Justice to a seeker? Who? Um, <laughs> it's, um, infallibility is such a difficult word to, to define. Um, and if possible, I think, for a seeker, unless the seeker is very close to the faith, avoid the issue. Um, because it sounds so strange in, in a Western ear and is linked up, of course, with the concept of papal infallibility in, in the minds of Western people, and which we have a sort of prejudice against to start with. Um, in a sense, it, it's the culmination of consultation. You know, as the principle of consultation is that one mind is generally not enough that um, it's good for several people to consult together with the idea of achieving a, a good solution. And uh, this is simply a process of the interrelationship of human beings, of, of the creating a bigger mind than one. Um, and you see, it isn't only the Universal House of Justice, it's, it's the guy, uh, Baha said that if a local spiritual assembly consults in the right way, it will receive divine guidance. Now, as it puts itself in harmony with the spirit of the universe. And what it does, it decides the right, right, right things. The only difference between the local assembly and the universal house of justice is it always achieves such a, uh, a decision. Now that's an oversimplification. It's a way you might explain it to a seeker. In other words, this is a way of, of, of electing people in various stages who know the faith well enough that when they consult together, they produce an, uh, 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 a decision that's in harmony with the facts and with the nature of the universe, and therefore, in that sense, is infallible. Uh, I, I think it's much more than that, and it's difficult to specify it. I mean, most, most consultations of the House of Justice are just like any assembly consultation, a, a consensus emerges. But then um, the House of Justice has to be much more patient in getting its decision. It knows it has to be the right decision. And I remember one occasion where, where we got to the point where eight of the nine members were thoroughly agreed to one particular course of action, and one member didn't. And the reaction of the other eight was, what has he seen that we haven't? And to continue consulting. And in one occasion, I remember, it ended up with all the other eight agreeing with the ninth. 
But I've seen similar situations where we still thought that we, we hadn't quite got it and we asked to consult on, and eventually the majority decided, no, we have understood it. We just don't agree, that's all. And they make a majority decision. But it needs careful thinking and the, the wish to get the right answer. Sometimes, um, you know, the Guardian said he would occasionally be given um, unusual insights as a result of the power of Baha'u'llah. It wasn't his own capacity. It was Baha'u'llah wanted him to know something and he, got, he knew it. And the story I heard of the Guardian coming into the room one day waving an unopened letter saying, he's lying! Um, now, he may have known the character of the person who was writing, I don't know, but that, that's the sort of thing that makes you sit back. But I remember one occasion when the House of Justice was dis discussing one question, and it was the end of the day. And it was a, a unanimous decision. We all wanted to do the same thing, and suddenly someone said, hadn't we better wait till tomorrow? Do we have to make this decision tonight? So we decided to wait till the next morning. The next morning, in the mail, came information which changed the whole picture. Now, but that's not the thing to discuss with the seeker because it sounds peculiar. Uh, but we have to be aware in the faith when you're dealing with spiritual worlds, peculiar things can happen. But generally, the House of Justice consultation is just like that of any local assembly, except from practice consultation. Mm. But as I say, it doesn't help much with the seeker. You have to judge your seeker and then see how to answer. Mm. <clears throat> the next question. What pitfalls should a budding Baha'i scholar avoid? Hmm. Uh, yes. A budding Baha'i scholar, well, it's obviously, you see, one has to realize what one's dealing with when one's dealing with the faith. I remember it was suggested at one time that um, at some Baha'i institution we should have a, a um, course of um, a master in Baha'i studies. And the House of Justice is impossible. You can't have a human being saying, I am a master of Baha'i studies. How big is this revelation? It's for a thousand years or more. How can you be a master of it? It's just a terminological nonsense. You can have a, a, a master's degree in uh, Baha'i, the application of Baha'i teachings to, to con conflict management or something like that, but in Baha'i studies? No one's a master in Baha'i studies. But the whole of, all of us are at the kindergarten stage of, of understanding the faith. And will be for quite a long time yet. Um, so it's, it's, first of all, getting the, one's understanding of the faith in perspective. To what degree can one expect to be a scholar of something that is a revelation from God to take us forward for one or more thousands of years? Is it possible? Now, a scholar, I think, though, is no, should, shouldn't ever conceive of himself as a person who has understood everything. The essence of scholarship, it seems to me, is a person who has the temperament and the skill and the capacity to study a thing seriously, to study it meticulously and seriously and, and carefully. That is a scholar. And a budding scholar is someone who's learning how to do this. And it's not always easy. It's very difficult in present day society, for example, because there's, um, uh, I remember one, one, I read one, one, one scholar was writing and saying that you have to have read the literature and be able to quote it. What in the world did he mean by the literature? Um, I mean, there's all vast letters of, of, of Baha'u'llah aren't translated yet. Okay, he can't mean all Baha'i literature. Um, he meant the writings, the published writings of other scholars in English on that subject. That isn't all the literature. It happens to be what a few scholars have written in English. What about all the Chinese scholars? Or the Indian scholars? Or the Latin American scholars? Or the German scholars? You, you can't read all the literature on any subject. You may read all the current one, but then you see in, in the pattern of modern scholarship, it isn't simply a matter of scholarship, of, of understanding something, but you've got a body of people who are engaged in academia and who out of courtesy should say, if, if Mr. Smith has read Mr. Jones's book and he's involved in his thinking, out of courtesy he should mention he's read Mr. Jones's book. Um, you see, that, that's where you have to quote your sources and, and give your references to other people. But how you conceive of that, uh, are you going to say because of this scholar who's done a great deal of study in this area has got these ideas that his scholarship is worthless because he hasn't read all this and that and that and that? It may not be worthless. It may just be, have gaps. So I think if budding Baha'i scholars are, get into the idea of thinking that whatever they, they produce is in its essence full of gaps, and be contented with that, and try to increase, uh, to decrease the number of gaps, to increase the accuracy of what they're saying, to be meticulous, 
That, I think, is, is, is the way to do scholarship. And then you can do all sorts of things, but one has to be devoted to the, the truth of the matter, not necessarily to certain patterns of scholarship. Um, because much scholarship nowadays is basically 100% materialist. And for Baha'i to leave out everything except materialism um, is difficult. Sorry, that's a bit mixed up, but you know what I mean. How do we guard against the emergence of fundamentalism within the Baha'i community? I should think I have a very good sense of humor. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and patience, you know. Some people are very eager, um, and they sound enthusiastic, um, but they're too enthusiastic. Um, and then one's got to get people to, to be able to look around things. Does it, does it make sense? Not, not merely, um, it, it, because, you know, it, it, the, one's got the principle that Baha'u'llah says that one should go back to the texts. Now, we should base everything on the, on the revelation, but also on experience in life. And um, one of the problems people sometimes fall into, it sounds rather fundamentalist, is to say, look, in this text, Baha'u'llah says so-and-so, that's it, finish. But then they've forgotten that in another text somewhere else, Baha'u'llah says something that reads exactly the opposite. And you have to understand that and see how they relate and think about things. So a fundamentalist, temperamentally, is someone who wants to stop you thinking. And of course, there's where a sense of humor comes in because you say, this, this, this is ridiculous. So if anyone says stop thinking, um, that's, that's the way to stop getting into fundamentalism. Think about things, examine things. The, remember The Guardian wrote, and I've heard some people say this mistake, that they say that, that the, in the independent investigation of truth is until you find Baha'u'llah. After that, it doesn't apply. But the Guardian has written that Baha'u'llah has enjoined the independent investigation of truth upon his followers. So why, therefore, do you continue investigating truth after you found Baha'u'llah? The answer is because you have the humility to recognize you're a fallible human being. And unless you keep thinking hard and investigating hard, you're not going to understand what Baha'u'llah said. You're going to misunderstand it. And that's fundamentalism. Misunderstanding and misapplying the re revelation. Thank you. How should we approach the study of the writings of Shoghi Effendi? Oh. <laughs> um, I think as part of one's general... Uh, one should study the writings of Shoghi Effendi as part of one's general study. We have the Baha'i Law that you're meant to read, read the Holy Scriptures morning and evening. And I think it's very good when doing that, in the case of writings of Baha'u'llah, to make a pattern of reading always through all the writings of Baha'u'llah. Just one book after another, until you finish the lot and start again at the beginning. If you just read the bits you like, uh, it's not the best idea. Uh, just, just, and, and then each time you read through the book, you you, you as I, enrich your understanding, which helps you the next time you read through, and you just continue to refine new things. So that's, you've got to do anyway, whether you're studying the writings of Shoghi Vindi or not. But then I think it's, it's um, again, you can take excerpts from The Guardian. There's The Call to the Nations or other things. You can read various summaries. But again, fundamentally, I think one should, it's good simply to read through all his published writings, at least the major ones. Just read them through patiently and think about them. Uh, because there are many things he covered. And it's probably best to start with what the Guardian himself wrote, there are many other things. But then that isn't all you're doing in your life, because you're administering your, in your local community, you've, you've got to keep looking at various things. But for an actual methodical study of the Guardian's writings, there's nothing like just going right through, reading the whole of God Passes By, and all his writings like that. Just slowly, slowly, I think. <laughs> Could you please share some of your recollections of the first international convention for the election of the Universal House of Justice in 1963? Yeah, that, that, um, they're rather limited, my recollections, because, of course, I was on the council, and the, one of the functions of the council was to prepare for the election of the House of Justice. And so we had all the um, so nitty-gritty work you do, I might say, about getting the ballots out and getting the delegates registered and so on. Um, it was a very exciting time. The hands were very worried because they were worried about anything going wrong with that election. Um, and there were some Baha'is at that time, one or two, who had obviously set out to tour the Baha'i world 
um, sort of donating things here, there, and everywhere, and are making themselves very, obviously, very popular and very, very well known. And the House were worried that in some cases it was not being genuine. Some people were just generally generous people. In other cases, it was obviously, uh, a sort of little tacit electioneering going on. But they thought, what can we do? If we interfere, it's the same thing. We can just trust to Baha'u'llah. So they did. And none of those who were fiddle faddling um, got elected. So the, the delegates were sensible enough, and Baha'u'llah looked after his cause well enough that that problem went away. But it didn't stop the hands worrying at the time. So as part of that business of trying not to influence the, the ballots, when the um, uh, delegates were arriving, uh, the hands decided that no males at the World Centre would contact the delegates at all, no matter who they were. Um, that they, uh, the women in Haifa looked after all the delegates and took them on their pilgrimages and so on. I had a difficult point because I was being the Assistant Secretary of the International Council. I had to get in touch with Bora Kavlin, who was both a member of the Council and the Chairman of the American NSA. He was the member at large of the Council. And uh, we were going to have a Council meeting and I had to get word to Bora to come and join the, join the meeting of the Council. So um, he was staying in a hotel called the Lev Carmel Hotel on top of the mountain. So I went up there in the evening, and um, the only way I could think of getting a letter to him was to sneak through the bushes in the shrubbery up to the window of the office of the uh, hotel and pop through the window and tell the man, say, please give that to Mr. Cavlin. So I did that, gave him the letter, and disappeared through the bushes back out again. <laughs> so Bora got his letter all right. But, um, and then the council at its meeting. But the main, this, these are all little, little details of a thing, but it was part of the care the hands had in the, in the management. Then, of course, there was a question of where to hold the, the uh, election. And uh, Rahir Khanum hoped very much we could have it in the master's house. And then one evening, uh, Ali and I were with her, and um, we thought we probably could manage it if we took all the doors off the various rooms around the central hall. So she suggested we try it out. So we took all the doors off and measured all the floors and everything. We found we could just get all the delegates into that hall, and that's why it was decided to hold the, the election in the master's house, which is very appropriate and very really wonderful. And, um, and then the spirit of the delegates was so beautiful. I mean, they were coming here to elect the, the Universal House of Justice, and uh, their whole atmosphere was, was beautiful. They had a little pilgrimage first, and then they gathered in the master's house, and they had the election take place, and then uh, the next day we had the results announced. So it was a very, very beautiful experience. That's, but these little details were really all that I remember because we were involved in Haifa. Yeah. This probably will be the last question. Of all the very many extraordinary experiences you had in the Holy Land, is it possible to single out one that was the most moving? Oh, God. Or the top ten, perhaps. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, this is this, I presume, is since the election of the House of Justice. Um, I think it's almost impossible to do so because there are so many moving events, um, and uh, many of them are very similar. I mean, they were moving in the sense of, of sad, uh, and there were many sad things happened. The news of the martyrdoms in Iran of um, other things, the, the uh, murder of Inuka Linga, the all oh, very sad things happened. Um, of joyful things, um, then there was the, the news of the results of, of uh, wonderful teaching work and so on. Um, in the process of consultation, there were some things which were very moving because um, two things could happen. One is the House of Justice would be consulting on a particular subject. Um, or it, a lot of people had written suggesting a subject on which the House of Justice then had to discuss. You know, this, this was interesting, that why did all the Baha'is suddenly want to ask these same sort of questions? And the consultation would start, and it would start in the normal way of people exchanging ideas, and then you had the feeling suddenly the consultation was taking, taking off. And it sort of evolved way above anything that was being thought of in the earlier stages of consultation, and you had a whole new concept, as it were, emerged in this process of consultation. And they are, their feeling of it was, was one of exaltation. This is right. This is, this is what it is. And no one had thought of it before. It wasn't the House that decided we needed to discuss this, let's do it. It was events conspired that the House of Justice could consult this particular problem. And this uh, arrived. And that was a very exalting feeling. And that's a very moving one to have. But 
apart from that, there's, there's nothing particular. There's many sad things, I say, as well as happy things. And um, that's, that's about it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, time is now against us. We need to leave the building before 10 o'clock. It's now 10 to 10, so we have 10 minutes to, to leave. But before we do so, um, on behalf of all of you, I would like to uh, thank, uh, from the bottom of our, of our hearts, Mr. Semple, for spending this extraordinary time with us, for um, enlightening us, inspiring us, informing us, stimulating us, challenging, challenging a lot of our, no doubt, uh, less mature thoughts and perspectives, and for bringing us very close, indeed, to two institutions, the institution of the guardianship and the person of Shoghi Effendi and the institution of the Universal House of Justice under whose protective, infallible, all-loving care, uh, not just the Baha'i world shelters, but ultimately the whole of mankind. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.